This picture was taken on the 6th of January 2021 in front of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. The riot in which protesters ultimately stormed the building unfolded after then-American President Donald Trump spread claims about the 2020 United States presidential election being fraud, followed by him calling for supporters of these claims to attend a rally before the January 6th congressional vote count. On the day of the rally, Trump held a speech in which he further promoted the claims about election fraud, additionally supporting the idea of a democratic conspiracy against him. In typical Trump fashion, his speech combines a simple populist emotional rhetoric with a narrative of good against bad or us against them. The speech ultimately led protesters to storm the Capitol, resulting in five people dying on that day. Within that crowd were supporters of QAnon, a right-wing conspiracy theory that claims that a secret cannibalistic satanic group of pedophiles usually associated with rich Hollywood celebrities and American Democrats is operating a hidden child trafficking ring. While these ideas might sound deeply false and garbled to the viewers of this video, they undeniably have a powerful impact on their believers such that they form their whole conception of truth and the way they think about the world they live in. Furthermore, the storming of the Capitol building is a disturbing representation, but still just a glimpse of the societal and political impact of conspiracy theories. In this three-part video series, I want to try and give a review of the phenomenon of conspiracy theories. In this first video, I will look at the motivations and reasons as to why people believe in conspiracy theories. According to American political scientist Michael Barkun, there are three distinct features of conspiracy theories, which he also calls conspiracy beliefs, that can be illustrated by the following statements. Nothing is as it seems, everything is connected, and nothing happens by accident. He argues that it is the combination of these assumptions that define the particular narratives of conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy beliefs assume a certain intent behind all events. Things that happen, quote, have been willed. There is no space for coincidence or randomness. Moreover, similarly to the X-Files catchphrase, trust no one, the way the world appears is not how it actually is within conspiracy beliefs. Therefore, conspiracy beliefs hold strong skepticism towards the ways things appear. Lastly, there is an overarching way of things being interconnected and related to one another. Connections are drawn everywhere. Everything can be linked to everything. The worldview of the conspiracy believer is defined by the dualism of good and evil and light and dark. Moreover, it portrays a world of meaning and purpose. We will come back to this aspect in the second part of the video. A different definition of conspiracy theories comes from German political scientist Armin Pfahl Traugba. He defines conspiracy theories, which he calls conspiracy ideologies or myths, by their distinction from what he calls a conspiracy hypothesis. A conspiracy hypothesis is a belief about a conspiracy taking place that is not immune against evidence that doesn't promote the conspiracy theory. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say I believe that my friends are planning a plot against me because I catch them whispering behind my back again and again. Then on my birthday, they suddenly surprise me with a birthday party and tell me that what I perceived as plotting against me was actually them planning the party for me. If my belief of them plotting against me was a conspiracy hypothesis, I would at this point be learned better and move on with my life. On the contrary, if my belief would be a conspiracy ideology or a conspiracy myth, I would not believe the evidence they provided about the birthday party. Instead, I may actually believe that the party is a part of a larger plot against me and is just a way of distracting me and making me believe that everything is okay while their master plan is successfully unraveling. For this reason, Traugba calls conspiracy ideologies monocausal, because they only accept assumptions that promote their self-evidence, while a conspiracy hypothesis acknowledges the possibility of being false. We can see that in accordance to Barkin's definition, this definition also holds certain presumptions about how conspiracy theorists think. In contrast to these definitions, the definition of conspiracy theories within the sociology of knowledge states that there is nothing particularly different about the way conspiracy theorists think. According to this definition, conspiracy theories are just another form of knowledge that people apply while trying to understand the world around them. Conspiracy theories then are good explanations for collective events that otherwise cannot be explained coherently. Other types of explanations simply aren't as comprehensible as conspiracy theories. 
This theoretical approach usually follows the conception of knowledge that was developed by Luckman and Berger in their famous work, The Social Construction of Reality. Knowledge within this conception is always socially transmitted. Therefore, the availability of information is an important factor for acquiring knowledge. The medial possibilities of communication that are made available through the internet provide a new platform of knowledge that creates an alternative public source for knowledge to the traditional mainstream media. Within the internet, there is no distinction between producer and consumer anymore. Everybody can be a producer of knowledge. Therefore, it provides a knowledge supply with theoretically infinite interpretations of truth. Through acquiring knowledge, we can make sense of something that might appear abstract, paradox, or incomplete otherwise, especially when the medial display of occurring events make their content seem complex, unexpected, or inexplicable. Conspiracy theories can provide more coherent and holistic explanations of these events. Cultural scientist Mark Fenster characterizes conspiracy theories with the notion of cognitive mapping based on the theoretical conception by Frederick Jameson. The notion refers to the ideological process through which individuals situate their own position within a seemingly transcendental and abstract social space and fill knowledge gaps by constructing a coherent narrative around the abstract reality they perceive. This can be illustrated by looking at the Bilderberg meetings, which again and again proved to be an ideal source of speculation for conspiracy theorists. The Bilderberg group consists of different people, including political leaders and academic experts of different kinds. The annual meetings of these people where the group discusses different political topics are very secretive and therefore leave a lot of room for speculation. The provided public information about these meetings pretty much only consist of the fact that certain influential people meet up, while there is a relatively low amount of information as to why they meet and what they talk about in these meetings. We are therefore dealing with abstract and incomplete information. If there is already suspicion towards politicians and powerful people, it is not that far anymore to fill these knowledge gaps with ideas about shifty activities taking place. But why would people develop such suspicion towards influential politicians? Within the sociology of knowledge, a collective suspicion can arise as a direct result of having knowledge about actual political conspiracies or scams that have actually taken place. The Watergate scandal or the fraud grounds about weapons of mass destruction that the Bush administration used to justify the Iraq war are conspiracy-like activities that actually took place. This seems to be a justified reason for suspicion. But there is another reason for why certain people could develop feelings of suspicion towards a powerful political system. It is the feelings of fear, injustice and estrangement that people experience that can be illustrated by the notion of political alienation. Within this explanation, the motivation of conspiracy theorists can be traced back to the suffering that certain societal groups of people experience. Conspiracy theories then are a way to explain these experiences of suffering in a meaningful manner. A conspiracy theory offers a narrative in which the suffering is shifted into blame towards a group of people that thereby can be held responsible for the injustice that is being experienced. A different branch of theoretical explanations for why people believe in conspiracy theories states that there is a particular personality type that is more susceptible towards conspiratorial narratives. Within these conceptions, certain people share certain psychological traits that make them more likely to fall for conspiracy theories than other people. In contrast to the idea within the sociology of knowledge about conspiracy theories being just another form of knowledge, here conspiracy theories are appealing to certain people because of their particular explanatory quality. This theoretical tradition can be traced back to the studies of members of the Frankfurt School about the authoritarian personality. Critical theorists Erich Fromm and Theodor V. Adorno developed the model of authoritarian characters who are more susceptible to fascist ideology due to a particular destructive development of their psychological needs. Adorno writes, The political, economic and social convictions of an individual often form a broad and coherent pattern as if bound together by a mentality or spirit, and this pattern is an expression of deep-lying trends in his personality. This psychological structure is defined by an ambivalent emotional pattern that can be identified by affects of submission, power, destructiveness, aggression and superstition. Therefore, certain needs within personalities are more likely to correlate with particular ideological contents. That doesn't mean that they are always necessarily stuck together, but more that certain personalities are more likely to believe in certain ideas. Due to the way they were socialized and their needs developed, these people are more receptive towards certain beliefs. 
Since Adorno came from a psychoanalytical tradition, he believed that the most important source of origin of these personality traits can be traced back to the environmental influence of the early childhood years of human socialization. Therefore, it is usually the family which will have the strongest impact whether or not someone will develop authoritarian personality traits. The way the family operates, on the other hand, is embedded in the socioeconomic conditions of a society. The study about the authoritarian personality that was published in 1950 had a strong empirical ambition combining quantitative and qualitative methods such as interviews and statistics. The basic conclusion of the study was that people that grow up under authoritarian familial circumstances will develop similar personality traits in which such subjects search for similar patterns of submission and domination. Authoritarian ideologies therefore appeal to such subjects due to their uniform, unambiguous and dominant explanatory nature. Accordingly, conspiracy theories offer simple explanations in which it's always clear who are the good people and who are the evil forces that try to take everything that the good side values. Adorno's conception of the authoritarian personality opens the possibility that certain personalities could be inherently pathological. From this point of view, conspiracy theories would therefore appear as a kind of collective disorder. Similarly, American historian Richard Hofstetter later described conspiratorial thinking as the paranoid style in his famous essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. This way of thinking is defined by the feeling of persecution that believers share. The paranoid style is defined by its mystification of certain external forces that want to or already are controlling the fates of humanity. Hofstetter writes, the distinguishing thing about the paranoid style is not that its exponents see conspiracies or plots here and there in history, but that they regard a vast or gigantic conspiracy as the motive force in historical events. History is a conspiracy set in motion by demonic forces of almost transcendent power and what is felt to be needed to defeat it is not the usual methods of political give and take but an all-out crusade. Unlike the rest of us, the enemy is not caught in the toils of the vast mechanism of history, himself a victim of his past, his desires, his limitations. He is a free, active, demonic agent. He wills, indeed he manufactures the mechanism of history himself or deflects the normal course of history in an evil way. American philosopher Brian Keeley defined conspiracy theories by what he calls pervasive skepticism. An attitude of pervasive skepticism is defined by the fact that any external evidence against the belief of the pervasive skepticist will be interpreted as evidence in support of given belief. As with the example of the birthday party I talked about before, it would make me a pervasive skepticist if I'm not convinced that my friends were planning a birthday party for me all the time despite the fact that I have the evidence which is the actual party happening right in front of my eyes. According to Keeley, such an attitude can help people to project meaning into a seemingly meaningless or scary world. It brings control into a world that seems to be random and cold. Keeley's description depicts conspiracy theories as knowledge of an almost pseudo-religious purpose here. He writes, The conspiratorial worldview offers us the comfort of knowing that while tragic events occur, they at least occur for a reason, and that the greater the event, the greater and more significant the reason. Our contemporary worldview, which the conspiracy theorist refuses to accept, is one in which nobody is in control. When the World Trade Center was attacked by Al-Qaeda terrorists on the 11th September 2001, there was a collective need for coping with these events. If a conspiracy of any kind is taking place, it provides a feeling that someone is in control, even if those people are evil-willed. The idea that the American government or certain people knew what they were doing still offers a form of comfort by picturing a world in which certain forces have control over what is happening as opposed to being surrendered to random forces. This explanation would support the assumption that conspiracy theories are more likely to occur within certain social circumstances. German political scientist Armin Faltrockba accordingly writes that conspiracy theories are more probable within historical events of change and crisis where explanations for the occurring events are required. Moreover, Traugbar writes that they can function as a constituent factor of identity. They provide a framework of ideas into which people can integrate themselves and be part of a solidary group that does the right thing together, fighting against evil forces or people. But this doesn't come without its cost. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories were responsible for the justification of the Holocaust, one of the biggest genocides in history, unique in its calculated violence. Conspiracy theories have been criticized for implying dangerous and other problematic potentials. Therefore, in the next video, I will look at the ways conspiracy theories can be seen as a problematic form of knowledge.
Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, as I've mentioned in the beginning, there will be a part two and part three uh, within this video series about conspiracy theories. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to my channel and give me a like. If you have anything on your heart or anything you want to share, um, feel free to leave me a comment down below. And until next time, bye bye.